Philosophers have been pondering endlessly for millennia about how humans think. How do we come to know things? How do we come to conclusions? Unfortunately, we may never know the answer to these problems. Yes, we do. It's called logic. Logic? What kind of witchcraft is this? How long has this been around? Um... Couple millennia now? I'm Zach, and you've fallen into one of my strange corners of thought. Buckle up, buckaroos! Today we're going to look at forms of logical reasoning. Logic is a field which studies truth and the basic rules that govern thought. This is done by positing an argument that is based on a number of different reasons or premises that support a conclusion. As an example, I may argue against purchasing illegal substances from my neighborhood drug dealer. Logically, we'd structure this argument thusly. Premises. Because, one, the last time I bought from this dealer, I believe they gave me below quality product. And also because, too, this dealer has a high level of shadiness over level 9,000. And also because, three, my friend claims this dealer robbed him, therefore, I will not purchase illegal substances from my neighborhood drug dealer. There are several different ways of structuring arguments. Some of the oldest recorded are deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning, also referred to as deductive and inductive logic. These have been around since at least Aristotle 2500 years ago in his books titled The Prior Analytics and Posterior Analytics, which deal with deduction and induction respectively. So what are the differences between deductive and inductive reasoning? Deductive reasoning is where we infer particular instances by reference to a general law or principle. For example, all humans are puny mortals. Philip Jose Farmer is a human. Therefore, Philip Jose Farmer is a puny mortal. With deductive reasoning, as long as the premises are true and necessarily imply the conclusion, then the conclusion must be true. The conclusion is already built into the premises. We start with a very general statement, that humans are included within the things which are mortal. The definition of human includes mortality. Next, we look at a particular case, Philip Jose Farmer is a human. The definition of Philip Jose Farmer includes humanity. Since humanity is part of the definition of Philip Jose Farmer, that means mortality is also part of Philip Jose Farmer's definition. So Philip Jose Farmer must be mortal. Let's look at this another way. The biggest circle, puny mortals, contains all things which are both living, finite, and obviously puny. Within the puny mortal circle is a smaller circle which contains all humans. And within the human circle, which notice is completely within the puny mortal circle, there we find individual dots that include you, me, Socrates, and of course, Philip Jose Farmer. One critique of deduction is that it doesn't get us anywhere. We don't actually learn anything new because the conclusion is built into the premise. There is no movement necessary to connect Philip Jose Farmer with puny mortals because he is already contained within it. We colloquially say that we're drawing the conclusion. But in this example, there is nothing to draw. The conclusion isn't going anywhere that the premises aren't always already at. In some ways, you could say that deductive logic is actually just really fancy tautologies like Philip Jose Farmer is Philip Jose Farmer. And as we've discussed before, tautologies are typically trivial. Now let's look at inductive reasoning. In many ways, it works in the exact opposite directions, starting from discrete instances and inferring general laws and principles. For instance, I could come across 100 swans and every single one is white. Each instance is itself a premise. Based on these premises, I could make the prediction that all swans are white. In fact, for many, many years, the statement, all swans are white, was assumed a part of the definition of swans. But it turned out that the conclusion that all swans are white is not deductive, but inductive. When European colonizers first invaded and explored Australia, they discovered a type of swan which was black. Unlike deductive reasoning, with induction, all your premises can be true. They can seem to imply the conclusion, and yet the conclusion can still be false. This means the best inference you can possibly make through induction is merely a probability. 
which isn't the kind of completely certain or apodictic knowledge we get with deductive logic. Based on the above Swan argument, it isn't unreasonable to assume, based on the above premises, that there is a high probability that most, if not all, Swans might be white. Because the highest truth we can achieve is a probable or statistical truth, Sample sizes, or the amount of premises you have, is considered very important in order to prevent another all swans or white fiasco. We see this today with the experimentation of the various COVID-19 vaccines. We have to make sure we have large enough sample sizes to guarantee that the vaccine is safe enough to be a valid vaccine, i.e. that it is more safe than not to take the vaccine, and it offers significant immunity from the virus that reduces severe infections and loss of life first for adults, then for adolescents, and now testing on children. However, this begs the question, what exactly is an appropriate sample size? If you turn to statistics, it will use very complicated math to determine what is statistically significant to safely assume a conclusion. Let's say a COVID-19 trial needs at least 500 participants to be considered statistically significant, which just means there is less than a 5% chance your hypothesis is wrong. But why 500 and not 499 or 498? Why less than 5% and not less than 1%? And just remember, the conclusion is not that the vaccine is safe for everyone, but that the vaccine is more safe than not to take, and by taking it, you reduce your chances of serious infection or loss of life. But here we blur into ethics. If one person out of a million suffers loss of life from taking the vaccine, is that enough evidence to invalidate the argument that the vaccine is more safe than it isn't? How many people out of a million would need to experience loss of life before it invalidated the conclusion? How many people that are vaccinated but still get seriously ill would it take to invalidate that the vaccine is effective against the virus. These are just some of the problems that we faced with induction, and trust me, there are plenty more that we don't have time to get to here. So this is the difference between deductive and inductive reasoning, and some of the critiques of both of them. Please like, subscribe, find me on Patreon, and next time you make a wrong turn, I'll find you in one of my strange corners of thought.